Oh, look. Oh, hi, everybody. Do we send an invite? Don't record it yet. Yeah. I'm going to check this. Um, um, we we only need to record it. Maybe that this is just up on the screen sharing and then that's a print server. Yeah. So it's being amusing later. Do you know that's going to be? Så kan jeg komme derned og dele skærmen her. Der er en dog, der går til herren. Har du lagt på Danish language? Beautiful. <laughs> I can't understand a thing, but I, I can't even guess. Can we. <laughs> we don't know what it is. Stutters <laughs> or... You just pretend to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone on Zoom. I just, uh, we are uh, having, we are still working on the technical aspect. We have a room in Copenhagen where Miriam is doing her workshop with composers, Danish composers, and the Zoom portion. So please hold on for one more second. Uh, or are we good to start, Loni? Okay. Well then, good morning from Los Angeles and good evening in Central Europe. I'm Thomas. I know a lot of you. I'm a publicist with White Bear PR. I work with Miriam Cutler and uh, I'm also serving on the Alliance for Women Film Composers with her. Before I introduce Miriam to you, I just want to give a few housekeeping announcements. Um, I know there's some people in on Zoom, especially who might have not been with Nordic Film Music Days before that join us internationally. So if you want to hear more about Nordic Film Music Days, please check out the website, nordicfilmmusicdays.com. Uh, um, we have workshops all through the year. The next workshop we will announce soon will happen in January. And then, of course, we have the Nordic Film Music Days and the Harpa Awards uh, February 12th and 13th. Speaking about Harpa Awards, very exciting. The five Harpa nominees will be announced next week. So please check your newsletter. If you haven't signed up to that yet, please do so. And also for announcement, please go on our Facebook page and see mm. what's new and what we are up to and what we're doing. If I could please ask everyone on Zoom uh, to please mute yourself, that would help us so we can, when we start with the workshop, and for the best viewing experience, I would recommend to use speaker mode over gallery mode. And um, Miriam is in Denmark, in Copenhagen, with a group of Danish composers. So they will ask questions if they have any directly to Miriam. And she will repeat the question so we in the Zoom room can hear it. And if anyone on Zoom has a question, please don't wait until the end whenever you Here's something that piques your interest. Please put it in the chat room and I will ask Miriam so we don't all mute and unmute. So please, any questions, whenever you have a question, just put it in the chat room. So that was all my announcements. Uh, without further <laughs> ado, I've, Miriam Cutler, we are so happy to have her. Uh, she uh, She's named the queen of documentary composing. Uh, I've been working with her for, I guess, a decade now. Um, she is Emmy nominated. She is one of the co-founders of the Alliance for Women Film Composers, has done uh, tons and tons of documentaries like RBG, Love, Gilda, Flannery last year. And uh, today she'll talk about story arc. She gives uh, a lot of tips on uh, creative approach and creative tools. She'll open a toolbox for us, but she'll also talk about how to craft a longevity uh, as an independent composer and artist. So we're happy to have Miriam here with us. And with that, I'll pass it on to Miriam Cutler. Well, thanks. And I really uh, thank you all for being here. Oh, live audience. Okay. Um, so this is really fun for me because to meet so many other uh, colleagues, you know, that are working in other parts of the world, it's just really interesting. And today we had a very interesting meeting about copyrights and stuff like that. It was really interesting to hear what's going on in various parts of the world. Um, I guess tonight what I'm really going to focus on is... I think one of the most important aspects of being a film composer, and we all know that it's so much more complicated. You know, there's being a musician, then there's being a composer, and then there's being a film composer, which is a whole other set, just like being a musician or being a studio musician. You know, there's a whole other set of requirements and skill sets that make you able to uh, produce uh, 
on deadlines within budget and handle whatever they throw at you. And working in documentaries, they throw everything at you. I mean, the, the film is never locking. It's constantly changing. They need deadlines when they need certain music so they can submit to film festivals. And you have to get all this done while you're planning ahead for when someday you're going to record when you find out when the picture locks which we all know that network of documentaries, you know, anything's possible. You know, sometimes if they don't get in a certain festival, they just open the film back up. Oh, someone said, oh, yeah, someone's at the door. <laughs> That's okay. Come on in. So um, one of the things that I've learned over my many years of working closely with um, filmmakers, especially doc people who are very serious about their work, they're very committed to journalistic ethics, so there's so many considerations going on besides just me writing music. I mean, there's just a whole relationship. And plus, it's rather recent, maybe in the last five, 10 years, where documentary films have really opened up to accepting the craft of music as something valid and not manipulative. You know, that you can actually craft a film using really important filmmaking crafts. And it can still be a very valid documentary adhering to the ethics and all those important things. And, and not going into the area of propaganda or reality TV. Um, I've actually been asked at certain times to try to explain the difference between reality TV and um, documentary film. It's, it's kind of like almost an insulting question. Not to say that, that, that um, you know, reality TV doesn't have its place in the entertainment world, but it's really quite a different, <laughs> it's really crafted for supreme drama and manufactured drama oftentimes. So what did you answer? Probably something snarky like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, um, it's you know, we really are kind of on this balancing act all the time. And so over the years, what I've learned is uh, one of the most important aspects of being a film composer, and especially in my world of documentary, and it's not really taught in, in all the music schools. A lot of them actually graduate from a film scoring program without ever having worked with a director. You know, they just go to town, do their thing. I'm a good composer. I'm working on this film and I did a great job. But the truth is, I'd say that that's half of the job is communicating, you know, um, successfully, creating an environment of trust and mutual respect where people can really um, take chances and try things. And we can be excited about this exploration that we go on. So when I start a film, I really try to create that kind of of uh, atmosphere between myself and the filmmakers and the whole crew, you know, the editor. And, you know, we're here to explore. We're here to discover what is the sound of your film. What is the musical universe going to be that will really resonate with this narrative? And how can we better support the narrative and make sure we catch the nuances? To me, the exciting part is not that I oh, get out of my way. Let me just, you know, write a bunch of music and I'm happy with it. What's really fun for me is what happens when I start collaborating with them. And it gets very exciting because everybody gets really enthusiastic, you know. And for instance, um, when I first start a film, I try to explain to them that, um, that it's really important to me to, to catch up with them. Like they've been working on the film usually longer than I've been involved, so they're much more aware. And I can only see what I can see, but I need to get in their heads. So I like to get started, and I find the best way to really get started is to start submitting some musical ideas as soon as possible, not worrying about, uh-oh, they won't, you know, they'll lose confidence in me if, if I fail or if they don't like something. But I want to establish an atmosphere where, hey, listen, I'm here with all my experience and stuff I've done and whatever talents I have to serve your film. So let's get started experimenting with some things. Not that, oh, I have to nail it the first time because then, you know, they'll be upset, they'll lose respect. And they kind of get into the spirit of it because what happens is if we spend some more time at the beginning of the project, really getting our communication down, learning about how to, how to talk about story, um, me teaching them, explaining to them what information I need to do a good job for them, you know, not just trying to pretend I understand and then guessing because that's a big waste of time. You know, I can just throw things at the wall. I just have to make the assumption that they've hired me because they like what they've heard that I've done. So if you like what I do, let me do it for you. And now let's get on with it. You know, here's how I do it. First, we explore together. And I also like that because it freshens my ideas. I'm not just spouting out the same stuff I do for every film. It's like, oh, this is interesting. I would have never thought of that. 
And I can't tell you how many times I've scored a film and I've, and, and, and I've been shocked at what I wrote. It had, it's nothing I've ever done before. I've never thought about doing it. You know, I kind of learn about genres of music by having them lead me to it. Like, I didn't really know much about minimalism or anything like that. I didn't even like Philip Glass, sorry. But, um, <laughs> but I really have learned to appreciate as a tool, using minimalism is really effective in documentary films. So um, that's what I mean. But it was a filmmaker that turned me on to it. I, it. You know, because they were so into him, I really had to figure out for myself, what is it that they're liking? You know, why do they like it? And I learned from that experience. So I'm always really excited about them, um, you know, sharing their views, sharing new music that I've never been exposed to. And uh, I take it as uh, the beginning of a great collaboration. So one of the things that I came up with um, because, you know, every, a lot of filmmakers are different. Some of them are really academic about how they approach it. They come from a film education where they've learned about, you know, act one, act two, act three, story structure, character arcs, you know, what happens in act one and then where, where you drop off and now act two. So oftentimes I'll start with uh, getting some kind of an outline from them if they have an idea in their mind, even if they're not even close to there. But I get an idea, what is the point of the film? What is their thesis? What is their, you know, where's it going? What are they hoping to achieve? So, you know, if I have a few story beats for act one or this character has some kind of transformation in act two, anything like that that I can get from them, sometimes they really respond to talking in their language about story and all that stuff and drama. Um, so what I did was, um, you know, if you open up Final Cut Pro or Avid, you see a timeline. And on that timeline, you see the picture and you see it, you can see it, for, you know, frame by frame if you want to. Uh, you can see where the dialogue is, where the spaces are. You can see where there's music or temp music. And you can really get a picture visually of what's going on right there. You can see if you open it up to, let's say, the full act one, you might see, um, you know, a whole bunch of information about where they've put music and why, you know, now my job is to figure out what they're trying to achieve with that. So I decided to create it. I call it the music story arc. And what I'll do is, I don't know if uh, I sent you the articles and stuff. So if you read the article, it's kind of explained in there, but what's been great about it is it provides a visual aid. And some, some directors, when I show it to them, they're just like, oh, I see pacing. You don't want too many cues together, you know, with little space. You don't want too few. Um, you don't want everything at the same tempo, unless you double time or work within that. Um, you don't want um, the same, you know, you don't want to have something in keys that aren't related because it, the transitions could be really strange. And you also don't want to have the same emotion, you know. So on the story arc, which I can show you, I hope. <laughs> we'll see. Um, Okay. Oh, here it is. I already have it up. So now I just have to share. Excuse me while I <laughs> do a little of this uh, screen share. Okay, where is it? Okay, here we go. Can you guys see that? <coughs> And I'm assuming everybody out there in Zoom land can see it. So, um, yes, it's on Zoom. Great. So this is just a, a visual representation. <laughs> and you can see how simple it actually is. Um, so this is act one. Up here, we created a legend of, um, you know, emotional tone. So, you know, it's sort of amazing how simple of an idea it is. Uh, and then, so we have an emotional tone, like the red is upbeat, um, you know, this bluish thing is somber. So if I wanted to look at the whole film, I could look and see, wow, this is what we've got right now. You know, maybe if there were three reds in a row, and then, I mean, you could visually look at it and go, that might not be working, you know, because it's just too similar. Um, there's also ways you can do it with themes and variations, tempo. So down here, if you really get into it, and this is what assistant editors are for. <laughs> we don't want to have to do this, it's hard. Um, 
but you know it has information like the, the timing in you know the actual uh, the, the time code number and this is really important I have decided from my experience that if they have an idea like they don't know before I send them something but I send them something and they go oh I want you to um, I want you to move something so that when John lifts his arm I can um, I want something to happen so you know John lifts his arm is that now 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 it could be like frame by frame all the way to here um, if they just tell me where they want it by time code it's so simple but I it saves me hours of guessing you know now I start with that as my point of departure but maybe I go you know I see what they're doing but I think I can do it better so I'll send something back that I think is working better and maybe they'll say oh okay no we really want it at that other number okay then I'll fix it but um, it gives an opportunity to really get beyond the, you know, where, does it, where should it start, you know. It gives us the opportunity to get into the creative mode much quicker because we're not sitting there trying to guess, you know, what they want. And I, know, I don't know about you, but when I'm sitting there going, I start to write music. And if I find myself sitting there having way more questions than answers, it's sort of a waste of time to start, you know. I try my best to figure out what I should do, but if it's really bothering me, like I really don't know what they want. And, and if they have a specific idea, I want to know specifically what it is. So they may not know ahead of time what the, that they have a specific idea. Once I send it, then they know they have something to work with. They can say, we like this, we don't like that, start this sooner. Or they might say, you nailed it, you know. But at least we're kind of on the same page. It gives us something to talk about and it gives us really specific information as a starting point. Now they can say, oh, I see what you did, but move it over to this time code number because I really want it to happen not in the pause of dialogue. I want it to happen when he says the word so-and-so. Let's try that, you know. And I also um, have discovered that I'd rather spend, you know, and, and before I start working with them, I set up the situation where, you know, I want to spend a lot of time at the very beginning of the film because I want to make sure we get off to the right, you know, that we're not wasting time. Because if we don't have time to waste, we want to spend our time writing good music, not you know, trying to fix mistakes, you know, and then not being able to write good music because we didn't have time to think about it. So I'm always trying to eliminate the question marks so I'm not wasting my time and their time. And a lot of times it's hard to get in touch with them and have a dialogue with them. So, um, before I leave this doc, and then there's another document that I've been using that's been really great. This one, um, you can also have notes about the character or what we're seeing on screen, you know, uh, and it's just a way of putting up a lot of information that I don't have to guess anymore. You know, I can make my first, my first stab with the most information. And once we get going, then it's really easy to change stuff around, you know, and of course the film is changing, which is fine. You know, but at least we're get. I'm getting into their head. Is this helpful or useful information? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, because you can always and ask me anything. You know, stop me. But it's just a, after years of doing this and figuring out the ways I can smooth it out. It really also I I, I realized that um, a lot of directors. It's so amazing. Like even really established ones. The first thing they'll say to me in a meeting is. You know, I don't know anything about music. You know, um, I feel really uncomfortable talking about it. And I'm just blown away because I'm thinking, here you are. You went out and shot this film. You know, you've made all these decisions about where to point the camera and how to edit it together and what you're trying to do. And you're telling me that you don't know anything about music. Well, you're going to know as soon as you hear something. You're going to either like it or you're not going to like it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, sometimes what they're really saying is that, well, we spent two years <laughs> developing this film. Surprise me. <laughs> Come up with something I didn't know of. You well, know. That's an interesting. Yeah, I mean, more often than not, actually, I think that's the case. Interesting. I think you're talking about very conscious directors here. Yeah. They really okay. know, you know, frame by frame when they want and what they want. But sometimes they're confused by how to tell you what they want musically, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah actually, I think that's maybe true. Uh, I think that we, we have, a, I think it's a difference between Europe and the U.S. We have a lot of like that surprised me. Yeah. And, uh, and if they tell you what to do, then oh maybe yeah. they don't get surprises. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. That is true. You should show them a real surprise one day. You know, yeah. put in some Jimi Hendrix or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really interesting because um, 
I think that, of course, it's also really great to have those kind of discussions with them where they're comfortable. They're not weirded out or scared just to see what happens or controlling and fearful that they're not going to be able to control the process. Mm. I do everything in my power to uh, make my process extremely transparent mm. and include them in it. You know, like that, and I don't just sit there and, and hope that they like what I do. I'm, I want to make sure they like it. So the only way I can do that is by being really transparent and open. Well, what do you think about this? And I might even warn them, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions because I want to know that I understand the most I can understand, you know, to get started yeah. and to get you what you want. Yeah. I had the remark once from a director, you ask so many questions. <laughs> you should say he should thank me. <laughs> and this was really telling me, stop and just do music. And I was maybe in a sort of same mood as you were talking about, and I was thinking, uh, oops. <laughs> he doesn't want, he, maybe he didn't want me to get into his uh, process, I don't know. It's true. But one thing you mentioned in the beginning, a respectful relationship, yeah. that's very, very important, I think. And that's, uh, sometimes we get those problems, the, 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 the lack of respect. Yeah, it happens a lot. Yeah. And I think they don't, what they don't understand, they don't want to know, just, just do it. I don't want to, they're so uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about it. Um, I tell you, at least where I am now, uh, I, I'm sort of interviewing directors when I'm like, I'm interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me, because I know that the way I like to work is collaboration. And I know that I, I do my best work when it's really a strong, respectful, creative relationship where we can try things and they, they trust me and I trust them. And so I actually, you know, and I tell this to filmmakers too, you know, it's really important when you're talking to composers, see who resonates with you. You know, maybe some people just are fine leaving it to the composer and the composer's fine with them leaving it to them, you know, and um, you can get great results that way too. But my own personal choice is to work in a more collaborative way because I want to make sure I'm telling the same story as that, as they are. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, so yeah. it, it is, a, it's like, we, we know from playing in bands, when there's a real fit, yeah. you know, when you really, like, there's some musicians you just love to play with because you just, you just it's like they anticipate what you're going to do and you, you just have a great vibe with them. I think it's the same with, uh, except the only difference is I make it my business to really click with them if I'm working. Like, I can work around them much better than they can work around me. Hmm. So I, I try exactly. to, you know, if I'm interested in the project and I really respect what their, their work and I want to do it, then I'm going to really work hard to find a way in and make it work, you know. And yeah, some of them aren't going to want to do the touchy feely part, you know. <laughs> How does it feel right here? Hmm. Um, but I think that's a good way to work since we are the emotional story. And that's what this is. It's really, you have your story arc, you have your character arcs, you have your acts. Then you lay on the emotional storytelling, which is the music. And that part is really important that it's calibrated right. You know, I can make you suspect suspicious of someone just by playing certain music and it yeah. makes the audience feel uncomfortable, you know, yeah. and, you know, and I can also make him like heroic or friendly or approachable. And so that's very nuanced stuff and you want to make sure you get it right. So um, I think a director who really cares about the music will want to work with a composer who does too. <laughs> And that's what I'm looking for when I work with people, because now it's like, why would I want to, you know, we all know how hard we work and how many hours it takes. And, and I feel like I want to work with someone who cares about it as much as I do. And that makes it much more enjoyable. And I know it's not always realistic, you know, you have to work. But I do think that we can have some self-determination in our careers. I'm very big on that, because I I was in the unhappy place of doing lots of stuff I didn't want to do and it didn't make me happy and I felt like I was wasting my life. And then I did a turnaround and started looking at it more like, from my point of view, what am I trying to do? What do I? What am I looking for? What makes me feel good? Because the idea is that I have had a really long career and I still am just as passionate about working on this stuff as I was 20 years ago. I've been doing it for 30. I spent the first 10 years doing stuff I hated and then I realized, uh-oh, I better do something about that. And I discovered documentary film. It just really resonated with me, the, the kind of people that they are and my value system and stuff. So I think that every composer owes it to themselves to try to create a life that you want to live and, you know, and, and work that you want to do. And we can have some self-determination, I think. I closed those other doors. I just said no. And it made me see other opportunities. You know, so Miriam, may I interject for a second? 
Um, uh, may I please ask you, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that also the Zoom people are uh, included. Yes. So if you don't mind closing the Excel Absolutely. sheet, if we don't need it anymore. And uh, okay. so, uh, so we, okay. <laughs> and if I could please ask everyone in the room, um, we are picking up every noise that is uh, like every time you move a class, you move something on the table, oh, you put no. your hand on the table. It really picks it up. So if you could please be very cautious about that. Otherwise, we don't hear. Miriam, that would be awesome. Oh, Thank wow. You. And please interject any time. Are there any questions from Zoom land? Uh, there's nothing in Zoom land, but uh, I, I just want to go back. Uh, you know, we I know we talked about the story arc, and I think if we could continue with that a bit, um, how you then, like, if we can go a bit further now, what is the next step uh, once you've, uh, you know, you, you, um, so you did this Excel sheet, you, you kind of have these initial conversations, you uh, kind of also some give your ideas. Um, and then what is the next step in the process to- Well, I would say, you know- In your process. First of all, this Google, th this document is a living document. It's not ever decided, you know, it's evolving mm -hmm. with the film. And so, um, and, and I'm a, you know, I think we try to get into a flow and, um, start playing with ideas, tangible ideas, things that they can listen to and make comments on, you know, because what I'm trying to do is the, determine some building blocks to, to be able to build a, a comprehensive score on ideas that work. There's no point in me just doing stuff and continuing to write when they may turn out to really not like that melody. So I better just get back. Cause I really see the score as a very holistic thing and not that different than even classic structure. You want to write a good composition and you want to have good material to develop in themes and variations, basically make real music that, that actually, um, I was talking about that this morning. I think, you know, one of the things I do when I'm writing a score is I periodically, I put it on my iPod and I listen to it as if it was an album, the mock-ups, you know, and I, you can really hear anything that's not work, that's not right when you just listen to it as a flow. Like if it's got a good narrative flow musically, if it's not dull because it's not repetitive, um, if there's certain melodies that I have so much ability to work with and change and do variations, you know. And if you have a good theme, you can make it happy or sad or slow or tragic or you know whatever you want it to be. And I think it helps tie ideas in the film together. And even though the viewer is not aware of it they're subconsciously fo following the emotional narrative, you know, as well as the other. And of course, there's also what is the music's purpose in every scene. So sometimes, you know, you can have a music story arc and it can be doing something that isn't already happening somewhere else. It's adding another sub subtext or nuance, whatever emotion that isn't on the screen. So we have, you know, so much power to change the narrative. Um, and we also, um, you know, there's punctuation. You can use it as punctuation. Filmmakers, when I say that, that really helps them understand. Do you want a period? Do you want an exclamation point? Do you want to me to underline it? Do you want to stop an idea and then start a new paragraph? It's really the same thing. Like, how are you going to, it not only has to do with the pacing and the flow of the music, but it's also what is it doing overall? Because you must, you know, there's so much going on. Uh, there's what's on screen, and then there's all these rhythms too. Like so, in a shot, within a shot, there's a car passing by, a bird chirping, a plane flies over, dialogue that starts and stops. There's all these rhythms, and if you catch the if you catch the right if you catch it right, the sweet spot of the tempo, you're gonna find that the music can just flow through all of that, and it, it's as if it's always been there. You know, mm -hmm. and um, that's what I really love. It's like catching a wave surfing, you know, mm -hmm. like you catch it at the right place and you're on top. Otherwise, you're underwater. And um, so these are the kinds of things to pay attention to. And it all has to do with um, that's the art, I think, of of it. There's the craft of getting it all right and timing and making sure your endings and starts and that it's playable by musicians. Um, and then there's the artistry where you create this flow that feels like it's always got to be there. It's the way it was. It's always that way. So um, that's part of the fun, too, is, is solving these musical problems. You know, a lot of times I'll score something and it'll be, 
it, it's perfect, you know, and then they change the picture. And I think it's really, really important to be able to not be attached. This is the Zen part. You just have to go, oh, okay, they made it better editorially, so I'm going to now make the music go with that, making it better. And, um, I mean, I never would complain unless I thought it hurt the film. But other than that, you know, I have to trust them, and then we can, you know, I can raise a question. But mostly I just wanted to and, – and it's really interesting when you, you have to do these musical puzzles, you know, when they have a, a two-beat – bar in the middle of something you know or they cut off your your nice beautiful cadence at the end you just have to rethink it and it, it often leads to really interesting music because if you listen to your your cues not with picture what makes them kind of cool is when they're a little bit not the normal structure and yet they sound natural so i think some of the most interesting things that happen to my compositions are what happens because i have to make some dumb change or you know where they've put it in it's like you have to go into a crazy time signature to just get it to hit right you exactly. know and and those are but it's it's really interesting what it does to the music i think it's it's actually kind of a good thing miriam how do you um take into consideration temp music when you start working on a project uh uh, you know, temp music they might have used regarding tempo, energy, and everything. Uh, how do you perceive the temp music? How do you then artistically, you know, kind of uh, work with it? Well, I, and make I it just, your own. To me, temp music is just more information. But I, I must make sure if it's good information or bad. So a lot of times they'll put temp music and we assume they like what's what it's doing. But I've learned my lesson many times over the years where they go, why'd you do that? I thought you liked that. Yeah. Well, no, we just threw that in, you know. So it's really good to ask them what they like and don't like about the temp. Because, and you don't have to do it for every single cue. You start to get the picture. Because what happens too is, in my experience, um, as I start replacing temp music that even they were really attached to, they get really excited because they're getting a real score that's actually for their movie and not for some other movie. And so um, they usually get very excited at a certain point and they stop being so attached. But it is just another way of getting information and we need to make sure we have accurate information. So if, if I say, well, what do you like about it? And, you know, maybe he'll, you know, we can watch, if we can watch it together or whatever, uh, then it really turns out there's not a lot they like about it except it happened to hit a cut <laughs> just in the right place. Mm -hmm. And that's really important information because now I know that I can really expand on whatever they've done and, and also um, bring it into the, the sound world that we're now in with their score and, you know, make it really cohesive and it totally makes sense, you know, and it's got musical integrity. So, uh, you know, once they start seeing how it comes together and, and sometimes I'm amazed, you find the right music for the, for something, for one cue. And then all of a sudden you just start like they, they'll sometimes I'll send it in. And then I'll tell them, please take these cues I'm giving you, cut them up, chop them up, show me, send me back a picture with how, you, with what you like, and move it around and show me what you want. And I'll find that they start putting it in all over the movie because they're liking how it works. So that's really important information. You know, it's all about getting that information so we can get moving and get the process underway instead of waiting to find the right thing. It happens not you know it happens that sometimes it takes a while to land on something in the beginning but i'm willing to go as far as i need to because what's the point of making them saying something like like some composers say well i mean you're only going to get two or three passes so you better get it right uh, i mean what's the point then every time they watch the movie they hate you because they're like i mean I knew it didn't seem to work, and I knew I didn't want it, but they made me take it, you know. So, I mean, the whole idea is to really wow them so they want to come back or they tell their friends or whatever, you know. I mean, we want to build a reputation which puts us in demand. So being, I, I think I, I consider myself a very director-friendly composer. Like, I really go out of my way to try to make them comfortable so that we can, you know, get the best out of each other. And it, it's really served me well. I think, you know, some people think I'm crazy because I'll go so far, but I think it's worked great. Yeah. Uh, Talking of... Uh, sorry. Ask a question. But you mentioned that you work a lot uh, on the beginning of the movie. Uh, but what about when or if there is another section where you think, well, this is actually crucial, or this is where the character or the story or the, 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 the topic 
is really the core and try to work on that. Because as you know, with writers, that they often write the beginning and the conclusion as the very last parts of their process. Yes. And, and yeah. I've seen this and worked in projects where this happens with the movie as well. But I don't know what your experience is. Well, it's interesting. I'm not a very linear person, but I am when it comes to this, to scoring. There's something about, for me, there's something about starting. And even if it's going to change, it's a point of departure that I can then create an evolution. And um, I like going through the film in sequence. But then again, I, the film I'm working on, they just moved a bunch of stuff completely around and restructured the film. So, but, but because I have developed a lot of material already, I'll, all I have to do is just kind of work with the material. They already like the material. So I can start to work with that. It's, it's very important that um, I have to take into consideration now maybe I have two cues that are too similar close together. So I'm going to have to deal with that, you know. But if it makes the film better, if that's the way they want to do it. And sometimes they're changing it back. But I'm kind of in it for the whole thing, you know. It's like I'm part of the team. And if they want to see what happens if they move, you know, this 10-minute section to the beginning of the film now, I'm going to go with it, you know. Because not, I always feel like if I've written some good music, it was worth it. I can use it somewhere else in the film, you know. And and so it's it's just more developing of musical ideas that I can draw from to fill out the score. And maybe it'll end up being the end credit. And of course, they always, the end and the opening are always really up for grabs. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. Because the film, also, the, the, the filmmakers in docs are, their, their film is evolving as they cut it as well. And they're, they may start out thinking they're making this movie, and then they realize the movie they have is something else. So they go back, and exactly. I'm just in it for the whole thing, you know. Did you, Miriam? Uh, I, you just said earlier that you know how to bow out, uh, you know, the filmmakers with your music, and I think that might also be a good uh, place. You know, we haven't listened to any of your music yet, so maybe I know you have some clips prepared. Maybe this is also the time to show how your music uh, um, goes with the story arc, how the musical story arc goes with the picture oh, okay. story arc, yeah. and makes an impact on the documentary. I have, well, here's one. Um, so I'll share the screen. Let's see, I think I'll do it this way because it gets to you. <clears throat> I, I don't know how it's going to sound, but hopefully it'll sound good. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, share screen. This was from a film I did called A Plastic Ocean, and I really care so much about environmental issues and I was really glad that I was able to work on something like this. So you guys have it. Oh, this is kind of cool. Okay. I'm just looking at yours. So do you yeah. mind? Yeah. No, not at all. It's like having my best friend. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let me know if I need to turn it up. first time that we believe that anyone has ever filmed a juvenile pygmy blue whale underwater. the coast of Sri Lanka where there hasn't been any commercial fishing because of the civil war. Beaches have been closed for up to 30 years. We thought this was a relatively pristine environment. Floating on the surface, the metre below, was just this horrible, crappy, emulsified mess of oil and bits of, you know, it's horrible. And, and, and looking through it, you could see the, 
the tendrils of the net hanging down. That was certainly one of the most unpleasant dives I've ever done. I spent my childhood in the sea. Growing up in Grand Cayman, we didn't have organized sports after school. We didn't even have a TV until I was 13. So the sea was my playground. As a freediver, it was the place where I proved myself to myself by traveling to the absolute edge of myself. I need to put as much oxygen in my blood as possible so that I can hold my breath for the three and a half to four minutes that the dive is going to take me. Five hundred and twenty five feet is beyond the crushing depth of Second World War submarines. So, um, questions, comments? <laughs> yes. So, back to your um, uh, tool, uh, the Excel tool. So, when I see that, I see like a wishful scenario that I'd like to be in, but my process is always total chaos. <laughs> and, um, you know, getting back to this clip you just showed, was it very nice? Um, how does this tool of yours translate into um, the chaos that is before we get to the stage of actually having a timeline? <coughs> because clearly with, with uh, this clip you just showed, uh, lots of aesthetic choices and temperature choices has been made, and I assume it's connected to her character, her, her light sweetness. Actually, I was really relating um, to the ocean, Okay. the rhythm of the ocean and the kind of the silence of the ocean. It was really interesting because before I started working on this, I just couldn't stop thinking about Debussy's Le Maire, which is the most, it's like such an incredibly, well, it's a work of genius, of course, but it's such an incredibly um, communicative, like you can almost see what's the scene, you know, in the music. It's such a narrative kind of composing. And um, I knew that I wanted to have that, some of that kind of feeling, you know, of course I'm not him, but um, I wanted to have like elements of, you know, like a harp, you know, and, and a really a sweet melody and things like that. But I also, um, a lot of times when I first start working on something, I just go through sounds and I see, you know, that sounds like the ocean to me. You know, it sounds like that rhythmic, really slow rhythmic quiet. So I think, um, I think the story arc is really more for them than for me. Okay. It's for them to communicate with me. But um, yes. But, but the chaos, I know what you're talking about, the chaos, we all have that chaos. And maybe that's what Miriam, uh, yeah. we should uh, push this method 
I mean, no, 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 yeah. no. I mean, I mean, whatever method, but you just have some some way of talking. We have to be better to talk together with the directors. And um, sometimes me and all of my colleagues, you know, get this problem that uh, that you talk with the director about the music, and then you find out that the producers want something totally different. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. would like to you to fix that problem for me right now. Let me do that. <laughs> well, one way to fix it is to get them in a room together. <laughs> Yeah, but even though, and then so sometimes the producer will say, "Look, um, you just go that way, and then we'll see what where it leads us." Yeah, but that doesn't help anything. I think that um, I, if I had to choose someone to collaborate with, I, I usually look for the person who seems to have a vision of where it's going. If the, and it should be the director and the editor. The editor might be the best person actually, oh, yeah. because the editor has already worked with everybody longer than I have. So if I'm having issues and I want to get a little, you know, straight talk. Of what's going on there? What are the relationships? I can, if I make friends with the editor and we start collaborating, we can then show them both our ideas in a little more developed state. And um, I've had that specific with a specific director where it just she couldn't really grasp the conversation, and so the editor and I would work on things together. The editor, having worked side by side with the director for a long time, was able to say, "Let's try this." And we'll see how she takes it, you know. I mean, we actually teamed up, and we actually met in secret because the director <laughs> didn't want us to do that. And if she had known, she would have been really mad. But it actually moved the project along so much better. And but, but still, uh, that's, that's the editor and the okay. director. But the director and the producers. Make the editor your friend. Yeah. Because the editor yeah, yeah, is yeah. working with all of them, okay. and they respect the editor. They really do, yeah. usually. Like in, in documentaries, at least, an editor is like a filmmaker. They really, they piece the story together, and yeah. the directors really depend on them. I mean, everybody's different; every situation's different. But an editor as an ally is a wonderful thing because they can feel feel me in. Oh, you know, they had a big fight today, so don't don't present anything today, you know, because they're still fighting. Um, now I've actually I don't have that problem very much anymore because now I basically any really professional group of filmmakers, um, I send my work. I, put, I give them a version with voiceover, without voiceover, and a clip so they can see. I mean, they might have already changed the film, but I want them to see what I did it for, like how it worked when it was written for what was on the screen. And what happens is it may take a few days, but they understand that they're going to give me notes. I'm going to get the notes back after they've had their discussions. And I'm not around for it, so it's kind of good. They can be really brutal. They can do whatever they want, and then they come back to me with notes. And so if you can get that to happen, you know, because there's just no, if you sit in a room with both of them, it allows them to be able to, to, you know, sometimes it's productive to have those conversations and sometimes they're just at odds and I don't need to be there for that. So they figure out how they want to deal with it. And, you know, I'm also always willing to say, let me, you know, if you like it, let me develop it and see what happens, you know, and, and then you can sort of get people on board. So there's ways to, I think by, Always remembering that my goal is the same as their goal, to make the best film, the best score, and um, reminding them of that and leaving, you know, encouraging them to explore a little bit. Um, sometimes they have, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious about, uh, it was a really beautiful piece of music. I'm just curious about your process with this. How, how, how well, was the process? Was it like an intuitive uh, thing or did you like have a plan up front about this scene music or what kind of process? You know what's really interesting? Um, it's almost like a jam session for me. Mm. So I play a note on the synth sound and I go, that feels right. You know, now what could happen? You know, oh, I loved when WC used the harp. You made it really ma magical sounding, you know. So let's see what I can do with a harp. And did you have a finished film at this point? Or no. Was it, no, it was just it was, you know, in the process. It was some, yeah. And I think this is where having a good ima imagination comes in very handy because you really have to be able to imagine what it could be and create that in my, I can create that feeling for myself and know that it's not perfect and it's probably going to change. But I go by my gut totally. I really do. I think um, anything I can do to open my own process up and be comfortable trying something and even going really far with it. And then all of a sudden I'll go, well, hell no, that just isn't working, actually. The music's really nice, but it's not supporting the film. And so uh, that's the gut check. So uh, I find it's really useful to, when I sh stop working at night, you know, I get to a certain place with a cue and I just stop. 
then I go to bed and I come in in the morning and the first thing I want to hear is that cue. And that's when I know whether it worked or not. Cause I went to bed thinking I was a complete genius. Yeah. And then I look at it in the morning and I'm just like, wow, it's totally not working. And the other thing that's really helpful um, is that if you have a family member or someone you live with, or, you know, anytime a friend comes over or whatever, um, I'm in love with what I did. And I think it's just fabulous. I'm just like, I should be you know, a star. And then, and then they come in and as soon as there's other people watching it and I'm watching it, even if I'm not, it's like nobody's saying anything. I'm just watching it with them watching it. And I get all sort of, all of a sudden I notice everything that doesn't work. I don't know if that happens to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really good way to gut check your work, you know, just bring someone in, don't say anything and just let them see it and see what they say. And I don't even, I try not to watch them because I don't want them to know that I'm really watching them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really interesting too. I've had my family members say things like, you know, I don't know, I didn't like it. <laughs> you know, it's like, and it doesn't even matter why. Like I might say, well, what didn't you like? I don't know. It just didn't, you know. And there I am. It just comes crashing down, you know, like I thought I was a genius. So <laughs> uh, it's all relative. But I think that um, all of that is good information. That's all. It just kind of gets you to put yourself in check and realize that you, we can, I mean, there's nothing more seductive, I think, than music. And you can feel like it's really working because you're just really attached to the music. And, oh, my God, look what I did. It's so amazing. I didn't know I could do that. And then, you know, but it's not working. So you just have to, okay, it's not working. You know, not the way I expected. There might be something you can salvage from it. But you have to be willing to start over. Sometimes I'll actually just start over and I'll go really far with another idea. And I'll go, hmm, I really think I need to bring back one of those ideas from before. And, and I think that's something we all go through. You know, we're just trying things until it starts to come together in some way that, that supports the picture. Do we have you any said, questions? You said about temp music that uh -huh. very often they don't even like it and, um, and they get very happy when you write some music for them. But sometimes it's the opposite, that there's yes. a piece of music that they love so much they can't, so uh, uh, you know, you they can't even get license closer it. and closer. And what, how do you work yeah. around that problem? Well, they I want think, you to do almost the same. <laughs> yeah, that's really tough. But I, I've actually learned to just be patient because quite often, you know, this happens a lot when they want to license a song. And I know for sure that when they try to license it, they're not going to be able to afford it. I mean, yeah, I don't say anything. Exactly. I just say you should really start the process early because it can take a long time. And um, uh, many times they end yeah. up, I end up scoring something, you know, yeah. that they thought they were going to license something. But I did have, like, sometimes they go, they tempt it with my music, and they go, please, can't we just use that cue? You know, and I'm like, oh. And it's hard to say no because um, it's working. And so what I try to do is I can remix it or do something to bring it into this world. Yeah. I try not to do that, but it's sometimes they're so, so attached. So you're talking about a cue from another film? Yeah. Yeah. They're temping with my music. Yeah. I prefer they don't temp with my music. Yeah, no, exactly. It's the worst. But uh, if they're going to, and then they fall, they really want me to do it, since I own it, I can. And I also take into consideration, of course, how long ago was the film. You know, I don't want it to interfere with any other film. I wouldn't do that. For, but you don't own the master rights. I do. Oh. Yeah. I When I do my contracts, it's a master use synchronization license. Oh. Yeah. And, and that's another thing. You know, if you're doing that, uh, you have complete access to do whatever you want with it. I can just take this. I did that on another film. I loved the string thing from this other film, and I wrote a whole new cue around it. To, it was like a rhythmic string pattern. I wrote a whole other cue around it, and it was so great. It was, you know, they really got it early because, you know, I had the real strings on it. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we do, you know, there's, I'm a perfectionist, but sometimes... Mm. You got to go with what's happening. It's just. So you have your little library working. Oh, I have a huge library, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah, and that's an advantage when you own your music. You can do anything yeah. you want, you know, with it. And I highly encourage. I think you have more. You're more likely to be able to write. You don't give up your rights. We had a big thing about it today. Um, in America, they really are trying to separate us from our work. Yeah. And. Um, that's where we're looking to you guys to hold hold your ground. So. No, but we give up our master rights when we make uh, film music. Because of the union? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. just a, it's just a standard. I, I don't that think anyone ever gave it much thought. Before. Really? But, because the, but not the rights to the composition. Yeah. <laughs> no. Right, but just the recording. Yes. Yeah, I own the recording yeah. too. 
Have you uh, done that with Netflix? Uh, I haven't done a Netflix show yet. Okay. I've been asked a couple times, and I kind of yeah. didn't like the contract. But, <laughs> um, no, that's not chapter. That's signal. Yeah, that's that. another. Yeah. Um, I think you know, at this stage yeah. in my career, I don't need that job, so mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. Why would I go backwards? Yeah. Um, and it's really important, you know, for our future. I mean, my my um, royalties are part of my pension. You know, I've been an individual solo person for my whole career. I don't have some great pension, you know, through something, some work I've done. So I needed to, you know, we need to count on that income. So you don't have a publishing company either? I have my own publishing company. Uh -huh. Now there have been, uh, I'd say out of maybe 130 films that I've done, I'd say I own probably 95% wow. of the music, which puts me in a great position now because I have a couple of different libraries come to me wanting to use some of it. And I also can pick up, you know, a couple grand here, a couple grand there, mm. just li licensing individual cues that people come to me for. Sure. You know, so I haven't, I hadn't been running it much as a business, but now I'm getting a little more serious because I'm older and I need to um, make, make it. Come on, <laughs> Miriam. So uh, we are a half hour. We have another half hour, and I think that might be a good transition also to, if you could talk a bit about, you know, I think you have such an interesting career also. And if you can talk about how you got into documentary filmmaking, why you choose that to basically, you know, to connect your passion with, uh, you know, your advocacy with music, to, to give an idea on how you got into it, because what I want to point out is, how you craft a career that has longevity, not only financially, and I also want to tap into that <laughs> because you talked about how you keep the rights and, and that is very unique to you and your career, but you can show that you can do documentaries, you can do independent filmmaking where the rate is not as high as a huge uh, studio film, but you can have a good life with it. So you, if you can tap and both the passion, but also then how you set that up as a business now and have longevity with it and give it on, on your personal example, how you did that. Okay. Um, I think that, as I said before, the first 10 years of my career, I was going to slip my wrist or else quit being a composer because it was so unsatisfying. And I was embarrassed to even have people see the things I was working on. And I thought, man, look, I'm very educated. I went to university, you know, and I'm a person with good taste. And I, why does my life suck? You know, I don't want to work on these ter terrible things. And so, I mean, I did make a decision about that. But it also coincided with I had been working and I went to, well, I had a very humiliating experience where I had sent a package, you know, trying, I worked for a very awful co film company. I did a lot of films with them, never talked to a director. They, they didn't want me to talk to the director. They just wanted me to write the music because they liked what I did. And then it was off, you know, into the American film market. <laughs> but um, so, so uh, at that point, I had a very humiliating experience where I went to a BMI dinner. It was my first or it was, you know, I just started going to them and I went in and there was a guy I had been trying to make contact with because he worked at his company, did a little tiny bit better movies and I thought maybe I could move up. Mm -hmm. So I, I walked in and uh, he introduced himself and I, I didn't know who he was until he introduced himself. I said, oh, I sent you a package. And then he said to me, oh, I remember that piece of shit. <gasps> and I thought, oh. wow, this guy Brilliant. relates me to a piece of shit. And I and I it mean, really hit me, and I went, I'm done doing these movies. I'm never going to do another movie like this because I realized if your name is sullied, what do you have? You know, that's your reputation in this business. It's really important. So I never t did another one of those movies. And then shortly thereafter, as I was kind of scanning, what else could I? How could I do this? Um, I was at a screening, and I met this filmmaker, and his name was Arthur Dong. This was in 1997. I'll never forget. And, um, you know, I, I had scored this film that was kind of mediocre, but he was friends with the filmmaker, so he was there. And he started telling me about this film he was making. I did not know that he was a really, really revered documentary filmmaker, like very, very well known in, in the documentary world. But he told me about this film and what he was doing. He was a gay man, and he was going into prisons and interviewing men who had murdered gay men and just letting them tell their story. Like, why did they do that? Why did they think they should do that or could do that? And it was, I mean, when he told me the story, I was like, oh my God, 
I want to work on that, you know. Um, because I come from a background, I was an activist in college and, and other times in my life too. Um, but so, you know, I mean, it was really funny. It was very low budget. I mean, in, but in fact, it's going to be shown at the Academy Museum uh, in a few weeks. They wanted me to introduce it. And it's so interesting because it changed my life, even though I didn't hire a cello player and I should have, but I just did it on my synths, you know, but I'm still very proud that I did it. And it did launch my career because what happened was, you know, it went to Sundance, it won two awards um, and it was just people knew about it. And it really established me with this very esteemed filmmaker. And then, of course, he was terrific. Oh, Miriam's great. I went to Sundance and I didn't even know about this whole world of documentary. I had no idea. And so when, it, when the film was so successful there, it was like it really turned a corner for me. And I said, these are the people I want to work with. They were from all over the world, wonderful documentary film people. And he was introducing me to all these people. And that was the beginning. And I feel like I had set myself up. I was ready to let go of that other stuff, which brought in, you know, pretty decent income. And I didn't really have anything to replace it with. But um, I just knew I had to stop. And so it was ever since then, when I follow my instinct and I get, the more I clarify what I want to be doing, the more I can actualize it. And I'm telling you, it's very powerful because most people are just bouncing around. They don't have anything, they don't have a vision for what they're trying to do. Half the battle is knowing what you're trying to do. Like, what do I want to do? Okay, do I just want to score anything? I don't care what it is. I want to write music and that's what's most important. Well, for me, that's not. I really want to do something, be part of something that I'm proud of and that I can believe in and put my efforts towards things that really matter to me. And so, and I'm not being judgmental, but I just know that that's how I'm built. And so to satisfy myself, I, I had to respect my own art being an artist because I care so much about what I do. And also you don't want to look back on, you know, I would think to myself, okay, I'm young now, but when I'm in my sixties, which I am now, am I going to look back and go, what did I do with my life? You know, did I throw away my creativity my life? Is that somebody talking? Oh, okay. So anyway, I think it's really important to have a conversation with yourself about what it is you want to do. What do you think would make you happy? Because once you do that, all the other people are bouncing around not knowing what they're trying to do. But you can be laser focused. When I came back from Sundance, I joined every documentary association I could. I hung out with all the filmmakers, got to be part of the community. And I, you know, they became not just colleagues, but some of my closest friends because we share values. And so it's built a real integrated life for me to have my work, which I give the majority of my energy and time to, but it's also a lifestyle. This is what I care about. So I highly encourage people. I mean, and if you want to do video games or whatever it is that really makes you excited, try to envision that for yourself. And what's a, what kind of path could you create towards that? If it's video games, then you want to, of course, go to the video game conferences and you want to Go to the, you know, and go hear the, the guys that do video games talk and mingle with them and maybe get a gig being an assistant or maybe they need somebody to help write. I mean, you just never know, but, but you've got to try. Try to figure out where you fit in, what is going to be your, your path. And most of the time I didn't know, so I really have been weaving around. I mean, I played in bands and I worked for these social justice lawyers and I just did all these different things. And eventually I got here pretty late. I was in my 40s when I started scoring. Um, but I just kind of fell in love with it right away and just kept doing it. So, you know, even if you, you know, and, and even if you have to write things down, like, it helps clarify, you know, if you've tried to think of 10 things you love about film scoring, and see what that adds up to. You know, for me, it would be, you know, something meaningful, something that can help illuminate shine a light on things or something that can help change legislation, something with an activist component, you know, an environmental film. And sometimes something like I'm a Gilda Radner fan. So scoring that was really fun because I loved her, you know, and Terry Gilliam, I did a film about him. So, you know, it's, you never, you know, whatever it is, you know, so I have covered a lot of ground of different kinds of documentaries and I'm actually good with comedy, but I don't do it very often because it's not what I get asked to do. But, um, yeah, so there's a lot of range within that. And think about how you can do that for yourself. In fact, one of my friends told me, you know, she's, and this is another thing, um, how, to, how to talk about money. I think it's really, really important 
I didn't learn this until pretty late in my career that like it always felt like it's sullied to the creative conversations to talk about money. But I've never had an agent or a manager and I've just created my entire career myself. Um, and so I, ha I, you know, once I started learning about how to talk about money and not be embarrassed or feel like I was imposing, you know, it was really great. Um, and I'll share with you, I created a document that has helped me enormously. Over the years, you know, we've all had these experiences of what works, what doesn't, weird things that happen that you never saw coming. And so I, all of that stuff, I put it together on this document. <laughs> and I, um, when someone calls me and they're interested in working with me, I tell them proactively, this is how I work. This is why it costs this. This is what I spend the money on. This is how you can control the budget by understanding what costs more. You know, so if for 60 minutes of music or less, I can do an all-in fee of this, pretty safely know that I can do a good job with this. I have a range of, of budget that I'll work within. Um, and then if you, you know, I talk about how strings are more expensive and vocals are often more expensive. And so that they understand that when they ask for something, they need to understand, well, it's going to cost more. And not, it's not even going to me. It's going to the musicians or the engineers or whatever. Sometimes I have to rent a studio, you know. Other times I can do the whole thing in my studio. So um, I think when you do that proactively, and it also answers questions, it, it gives you something to talk about. When they, Instead of them asking the same questions everybody asks over and you're just sitting there getting bored talking about it, I say, well, let me send you this document. It explains my process, what you get for the money, how, how the budget can get lower or higher, um, and my tech specs. It includes everything. And then I say, you know, call me if you have any questions. We can talk about it. And it helps to do the first conversations at a much higher level. They're more sophisticated. They understand what's going on. They may have questions about it. Um, and I'm happy to discuss it. But I don't have to start it from zero with every single person I talk to. And it's been very, you know, and it also I noticed it made an immediate change in how they treated me. They, I, I was behaving more professionally. And they treated me more professionally. All of a sudden, they respected my time. Oh, we understand, you know, that this, you know, that you're going to da da da. And it was like, wow, this is like magic, yeah. you know, because it, after, before that they go, oh, I know you just push a button and all this music comes out, and, <laughs> you know, sure. now they understand. Is know? that a document you would like to share? Sure, I could share it. Um, what I'll do is I'll send it to, to Lone yeah. and, and I'll include some other things too. There's a couple right. articles. There's an article I wrote and then there's a really great article in the IDA magazine uh, by Jim Lebrecht, who's a wonderful mixer. And he talks about mixing music and sound design and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, there, I'll have the, the music story arc, and I'll also put in the other thing that I've started doing in the last few years. We have a live Google Doc online. And it starts off with hopefully the assistant editor going through the film and putting all the cues, of the, temp, the temp music that's in there, um, where, you know, the starts and whatever. And then what they like about it is just in a little box and what they don't like. So we don't even have to talk about it. They go, you know, we like when it hits here and that's all we like, you know, <laughs> or we want you to do something close to this because it's just amazing. And then I try to find a way to do something close that isn't, you know, that's still got integrity and is part of my score. But I think um, it just changes everything. Like you don't have to keep asking questions and every morning it's live. So when I do something or if I have questions, I write them in my little box and um, and then I get up in the morning, I look at it, and I see if they've read anything and if they've answered any questions I had. Um, otherwise, I'll and I and then I also every you know when I upload stuff for them, I have my own server. So that makes that's a good way to work having your own server. And um, every day, you know, when they have a new cut, they might send me an email. We've got a new cut, or we we want you to work on this scene, and we've got a new cut of that scene. You know, so it's really a great constant communication. And um, their notes are usually, some of them are amazing. They're so good. They're like, and at 1.0202, you know, they give me the time code because I trained them, tell me the time code. And so I, I wake up, there's notes that say, we want you to move this cue to this time code. And then we want you to leave the rest the same from this time code on. Now I can work, you know, I don't have to sit there wondering about all these, there's so many details, but this is, it's a live document. And I, I, I can show it, but I can also just send it. Um, and uh, I highly recommend working that way. It's also another step in a direction showing them I'm a professional. Don't waste my time. You know, give me the information when I need it. 
and they're trained to do that now and it makes everything go much faster and smoother and when there's notes I can address them so easily because I have really specific information. I'm not guessing. I wonder if it's that they right. What if I put it here? You know, I mean, you know, I want to give them what they ask for, and then I might say, "Hey, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna give you an alternative because I had another idea." But I want them to also get to hear their idea because sometimes they see that my idea is better, or sometimes they really like their idea better because I didn't understand what the point of it was. So these are ways to just get going and not waste a lot of time. You know. Yes. And how do you force the director to be that specific? Well, hopefully. I mean, Miriam, can you repeat? Can you repeat oh, the question? Actually, we didn't hear that. Yeah. How do you get the the director to cooperate with that? Yeah. With me asking for that's specific. something that I can get from the editor and the assistant editor. But like in the case of the film I'm working on right now, I'm interfacing mostly with the producer. I've worked with the filmmakers before, and it's been very smooth, but I'm mostly interfacing with the producer who's kind of acting like a, she's like organizing this. And um, I'm getting information from the editor via the producer. And then the assistant editor is doing all the let, all the work of filling in the forms. And, and so, you know, it's really working well because they have a nice team. Sometimes it's just the editor and the director. Um, and it's a lot of work to fill out all this stuff all the time, but it is really worth it. It is really worth it because I get up every morning and I know what I'm supposed to do, you know. And if I have a question, I can email the I can email the assistant editor, and she'll go ask the editor or the you know. And if or or the producer will go ask the um, directors. But they've they just had two films come out at the same time. We're working on this, so they've been really busy with the awards season. Um, and but I you know I get their notes through these other people, so. It's working really well, so I, I recommend that. There's all these little ways of just making our lives better, you know, instead of wasting a lot of time not knowing what you're supposed to, what you should do, and not having answers. And they know that if they give me the answer, what the quicker they give me the answer, the faster I get more done. And they're always happy about that, you know. A question, Miriam. Yes. Um, Two questions, well, oh. three really. Uh, first of all, um, the documents, would you also feel comfortable if Loni shares it with everyone that is on Zoom today so they can also get the package of the document? So we'll, yeah. we'll talk to Loni so everyone in the room will share that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the question that come, came up earlier um, do you ever involve uh, live musicians before oh. the film is locked? or do you record everything when you know exactly what you want to use? Or do you sometimes use live musicians to give uh, the director an idea what it would sound like? So um, I am a big fan of waiting till everything's approved. And I also, on my document, I explain to them, if you want me to deliver the music on this date, back time three weeks, that's when I need all the approvals. So they start off knowing all this because I put it back on them. You want it at this date? Okay, I need them approved by this date. Now within that, there's some flexibility. Um, you know, like maybe I, I say anything you can approve, approve it. And I could start post-production, the pre-production on the music faster, get the music prep involved and set up the dates and set up the sessions and stuff like that. And then work on the cues that aren't approved while they're getting ready to start recording. Um, I always use live musicians. I just did an electronic score. Um, and at first I was heartbroken because they were saying, oh, no, we don't want any, you know, we just want electronic. But of course, once I started showing them how cool it would be to have strings with the electronics and guitars and stuff, they really got into it. So I like having a mix, you know, if you're going to do electronic. Um, but I, I really, if it's a, something that's supposed to be a live instrument, I want to have a live player. But so for the for showing them things and this is really you know um there are tremendous really good loops out there like if i'm doing a groove and, and i want them to feel what it's going to feel like um i i find all of these ways of finding a loop i can work with you know where there's just no way around it they got to hear it played correctly you know not by me trying to mock it up i'm not a great you know whatever so I think um, I use loops a lot to sort of put together, this is what it's going to be like. And I do a lot of manipulation, you know, to, to bend the loops into my cue. But I just explain, you know, it might sound a little wanky, but I want you to get the right feel. You know, it's like soul jazz or, 
or like a string motif that's rhythmic, you know, I might do that. Um, but so rather than bringing in a live player, I might buy some samples. Like I'll go on and go, oh, look at these great guitar grooves. Oh, maybe I'll find something there. And sure enough, I do. But I tweak the hell out of them, you know. But at least they sound like real guitars and they groove. So um, that's the way I handle that. I think, you know, because my some of my players are some of my best friends. We've worked together for 30 years. Um, so I can ask them, you know. But I, I sort of, it's too much work, you know, to do that. Like it's takes me away from what I'm doing. I'm composing right now. I want to give them just enough for them to understand the concepts and understand what the music will be. And then I just say, it's going to be like this, but more beautiful. <laughs> and, um, and then I explain to them how when you track with a lot of samples and stuff and, and synths, uh, it basically, sonically, it pretty much fills up the tracks. And, you know, if you want to have your dialogue floating on top, um, you don't want to have such a, such a, just a, that fills up everything. You know what I mean? So when you have a lot of live players, it, the music has more, it's breathes. And then and, they better like the demo. Oh, I've had that happen. Oh my <laughs> God. They made me take out the real guitars once. I, I wouldn't do that now, but I, I, I it's just really depressing when that Would happens. Would you say no to that? I would now. Yeah. I would say, I don't think I'm the right composer for this show. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I, that, that's after you record it. Yeah. So that's too late for them to get another composer. Well, okay. then I guess what I'll do is I'll probably find a way to change it so that they'll like it. Okay. It's a, it hasn't happened like that, but I have had people kind of like, why do we have to you know, pay yeah, for yeah, live musicians? Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I'm beyond that now because what I've actually, this is important. I've had documentary filmmakers come to me and go, I know, I know you want to work with live musicians. That's right. That, so that's my reputation. You want to hire Miriam? She works with live musicians. That's what she does. It's like that's my that's part of my brand. So that's what they wouldn't come to me if they didn't. You know, I say, look, you hired me because you liked this score or that score. This is what I did. You know, I used live musicians. That's why you like it. And so I'm always advocating for that. You know, more live musicians. You know, no, the samples aren't as good. Even if it sounds the same, it doesn't feel the same. And 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 cumulatively, also when you have a whole score that's filled to the brim with all the sonic stuff filling up the tracks. I think there's actually audio exhaustion, you know. Um, I think people's ears get burnt out. But how about if you recorded half into the process, then you would have all these audio things you could play around with. That's true. I have friends that uh, bring in players early and then they use them as samples, which I could do. I haven't had to really, but um, my mock-ups are quite good usually. I put a lot of into them, you know, I, I try to, you have to do a, a good enough mock-up that, that they get it, you know, you but don't want them that's to. That's what I mean, if you do it at the end, the last three weeks, it's almost like taking a chance because it's going to be pretty oh, yeah. different sounding. With live. It's sometimes scary, you know, yeah. like I, but I always record a version exactly how they approved it. And then when other musical cool things happen in the sessions, I give them the option, you know, but I can always go back to what they liked. And sometimes I do. I think it's interesting you're talking about your brand when you deliver something, you have to preserve your brand. And even though it's in conflict with the film, you, you, you uh, talk about your brand. Interesting. Well, I think for me, <laughs> the musical integrity, um, I don't want to do music that I don't think is good. And so um, that is a kind of a, I mean, at this point in my career, I can do that because I really don't care. I can just be off a job and that's fine with me. Um, you know, when I was younger, I had to compromise more, but I've, I've tried to make people very aware of what matters to me. So in another way, I've been able to turn it around that this is what matters to me. Okay. I care totally about the music. I want it to be the best it can be for your film and I'm going to protect the quality. And so they know that going in and I make it really clear, you know, and I think it helps to get them to pay more attention to that stuff because they don't come into every relationship with a composer really thinking it's that important. It's just music, you know. Well, no, I mean, it's really can make a difference. You know, I've seen it ruin good movies and I've seen it make good movie, make mediocre movies feel really important, like any Hitchcock film, right? <laughs> Bernard Herrmann's music, you know, Vertigo, excuse me, you know, Psycho, it feels like it's the most important movie ever. You know, it's just the music is so brilliant. 
you know, so, um, you know, I, I think it's, a, you know, it's worked for me. I, that's what I'll say. It's worked for me to have the kind of work I want to do and to be treated in a way that I want to be treated, you know, and that there's respect for the music and respect for the process and that they have to be committed to participating to some degree to make it work, you know. So, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Why not, right? <laughs> I'm in charge of me. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I can do. <laughs> I, I think it's so interesting. I mean, every time I talk to you, it's so inspiring and, and you know, how you really craft your career and set yeah. the tone of what your needs are, what you need. But, you know, it's not that you don't listen because you're an amazing collaborator, you know, meaning uh, knowing what you need and who you are as an artist and having your brand doesn't mean not collaborating, not oh, listening, not taking in and not merging also. But I think that's such an inspiring career. We have about five more minutes and I have three more questions in the chat room, if I may just, okay. and they are from different areas, but I, I just want to make sure because people have been putting in, it in here and I hope we get that answered. So to go back to, uh, to mock-ups, uh, so you mentioned you always work with live musicians and it's your preference, but early in your career when the budget wasn't there or didn't allow you to do so, did you deliver full mock-ups and that's what was put in the score? What do you recommend to younger composers that are not in the position to use live musicians yet, maybe? Well, I think what I started doing was I just, whatever I could afford, one player, okay, I'll take it. You know, I wanted to hear one player and, you know, I didn't even have time or money to do the charts. I mean, we used to literally sit there and I'd go, bad guy chord, D minor, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was like that. Um, and then I started getting more sophisticated. And then I said two, at least two musicians. You know, I'm, okay, I'm going to have one string player overdub a bunch of stuff, you know, and as I could, I, you know, I invested in the sound of my music because I wanted to get hired to do music that I thought sounded good. If you just keep doing something that you don't really think is good, you'll just keep getting work like that. You know, I, if you're going to, uh, if people are going to notice your work, you have to do your best work. So I don't want my name on. In fact, right before I stopped doing those bad movies, I decided after that guy said that stuff to me, I decided I should have an, a, a, a pseudonym. And I did. And I did one more film under the name Max Baxter. And then <laughs> I never did another film like that, you know, but I could have because I had that name. But I realized I didn't even want to spend one more minute doing it. So why should I, you know? Let's forget Max Baxter, you know? <laughs> he died after one film. You know? Know. <laughs> I named it after my story. <laughs> Miriam, we have to, sorry, I'm sorry to interject, but Loni just told me we have to stop. So oh, sorry, okay. there were too much. So just quick, quickly, what are some of your favorite loop libraries? If you can tell two companies that you like, two loop libraries. Okay. Well, Big Fish is wonderful. They always have lots of new, really current stuff and they're constantly growing there. So I did a film recently where I was doing kind of updated disco and it was really fun to go on there and just, oh, this is what that means. Hot, whatever. I don't know. This has all these names for this, you know, uh, you know, and I, I'm really not up on all that uh, pop music. But there's people making loops for it. So I went, okay, well, that works for me. You know, I run it in. They're just tools. And um, and so it got me closer to understanding. And then I could write music, cinematic music around it. So, yeah, Big Fish always has a ton of Big stuff. Big Fish, cool. And Loop. just in one sentence, how, when you, uh, just a technical question, when you work on a documentary and there's dialogue, there's voiceover, how do you work so the music doesn't get in the way of the dialogue? Can that be wrapped up in two yeah. sentences well, or so? I would so? say composition, <laughs> composition and orchestration. You know, um, you can have a fully developed theme happening, but you can also do it in a more subtle way. Extend the melody, make it longer, extend the harmony structure, make it longer, slow it down, make it simpler, and how and what instruments you use. Um, I'm really careful about, I think the composition of the music and the orchestration of it has to work with as a bed, you know, especially in documentaries. So I think um, just pay a really attention to it. Turn up the dialogue really loud and see how the, much of the music can make sense and be meaningful and at what volume. And if you take out this and that or you slow it down, all of a sudden it's working. And I think it's really important that it have musical integrity, you know, compositional integrity. I'm really, I want to hear themes, you know. I can't stand seeing these films that don't have any themes. You know, it's <laughs> 
Come on, you just put your hand on a note and held it. You know? <laughs> Not to say that pads are bad, but they need to have something going on, you know. And the last question I have is for Loni. Uh, will the video recording be available uh, for people on Zoom? Will you send that out? Will that be? Uh, yes. It will be on Nordic Film Music Days. Come. Thank you. And I know uh, we could talk another hour, but uh, there is another meeting. So I just want to thank everyone in Copenhagen who attended, uh, everyone on Zoom, everyone that helped make this happen, uh, Luis Schultz, uh, everyone, Loni, of course, who is uh, who is our hero getting everything done. And, and uh, showcase and, brought me over here, so. <laughs> and, and Miriam, thank you for your American time, for your inspiration. And we hope to see you soon. And please join Nordic Film Music Day, sign up for the newsletter and join us for the Harp Awards. Loni? <laughs> yeah. This is for Miriam. Oh, it's um, 50 Danish film and TV tapes. Oh, wow. And, and some of the themes are made by people. Singing. People here? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Is, is it sheet music or is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Sheet I'm impressed. Music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe there will be some. No. Maybe it's inspiration. <laughs> oh, maybe inspiration, right. I'll get close, but I'll never copy. But it's really been great meeting everybody. I wish I could have met all of you. Um, but, you know, we're all around. I think we're all kind of hopefully be traveling a lot more and seeing each other at festivals and things. So good luck with it all. I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. <laughs> I guess I have to.